Today on the show, we're going to focus on the offense, namely, what's their ceiling? How good can this group be? And are the pieces in place to support a candidacy for MVP for Geno Smith? Michael Thompson of 12th Man Rising joins me to discuss it on this edition of Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. Be sure to like the video and consider subscribing to the channel. It's the best way to support the show and ensure that you never miss an episode like this one. Joining me again on the show, my old friend Michael Thompson of 12th Man Rising. And we're going to talk some offense today. Michael, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Uh, it's kind of a weird start to summer so far here in North Idaho. It's like 50-something degrees and a little rainy, but uh, I'm enjoying it. You know, the Mariners are kind of disappointing, but the yeah. Seahawks are are kind of the little darling of the, the summer so far, it seems like. Yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of a sad statement of uh, the current affairs of the Mariners when Seahawks off-season topics are more compelling. Than they are. I feel like I feel like we're back in the Legion of Boom era. Oh boy! But we we get to talk about offense, and and I was really excited to do this because so much of the focus this offseason has been on the defense because of questions uh, along the front seven, Bobby Wagner coming back, all the excitement about the talent in the secondary. Um, that the offense has almost been taken for granted now, and I, and I I think that in and of itself is a positive because there's so many pieces in place that they've been building now uh, for that offense. And you did a piece on 12th Man Rising recently uh, that I thought broke down, um, it kind of encapsulated uh, how talented this offense is and how good they could be and what that might mean for a potential MVP candidacy for Geno Smith. And you broke it down into, uh, into three points. And if you're watching the YouTube version here, I actually kind of put those up and, and it begins with just the pieces around Gina, right? Is this the best supporting cast any quarterback has had in Seattle in, in quite some time? It's the best that I could think of. You know, you, you talk about the best teams of the Seahawk era. You're looking at the 05 Seahawks, which obviously had the best offensive line that Seattle may ever have in the history of their franchise. The best left, left tackle of our generation, arguably one of the best left guards of our generation, a solid center. That allowed Matt Hasselbeck, who was a, a above average quarterback, to be great. And for Sean Alexander, who was a very, very good to great running back, to be a legendary MVP type running back. And then you go to the Seahawks era of, of early Pete Carroll when, when we were in the, the Super Bowls. You know, that was a, a massive grounded pound with a, a good to very good offensive line. And then you had a style of play that just was unmatched by anybody in the NFL other than Jim Harbaugh's 49ers, in which if you got tired of getting ran over by Marshawn Lynch and you started to overhelp, then Russell Wilson back then who could run a 30 yard touchdown, like it was nothing. He would take that out. And that just caused everybody to bring everybody in. And then the play action was easy for guys like Doug Baldwin, who was an unbelievable receiver and, J and uh, Jermaine curse who was a very, very good receiver in, in golden Tate. We only had for one year really of the, of the great run, maybe two years if you want to consider it. But I think you can make a strong case that, from an offensive side, we might, I don't know if we've ever had this wealth of talent on an offense in terms of offensive line, the running back position, the tight end position, the wide receivers and the quarterback with an offensive coordinator that I'm really, really excited about to see what they can do this year. Yeah, I think you're right. It's interesting to put it in perspective of, of what we've seen over the last 15 years, of the Seahawks, because they're, they're at their peaks uh, offensively. There's been they've they've relied on they've had one or two stars and then a bunch of complementary players. I think the exciting thing about this offense is you can make a case, and of course we haven't seen these guys on the field yet, but you have Ken Walker and we saw what he could do last year. You're excited about his potential, but then you draft a guy in the second round in Zach Charbonnet who could be a starter for most teams and might have you know uh, outstanding NFL starter upside. You draft a third wide receiver in Jackson Smith and Jigba and add him to Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. So instead of drafting a complimentary player, you're adding a potential star to two other stars. Your, your tight ends, you have three guys that could go on uh, probably to any other team in the NFL and start. And now on the offensive line, it seems like they're filling in holes too with guys that aren't just role players, uh, 
system scheme fits, but, but guys with elite athletic traits and skills um, at almost every single position really on the roster for the first time that I can remember on offense, there's a guy that, that you can say that guy can be a pro bowler really on it at every position. And that's, that's the exciting part, right? That Gino's got so much to work with. <laughs> it, it, it almost sets him up to, to not fail really. Yeah. I think a great, you know, the way to look at it is, is what, your position group has that compared to other teams out there in the league. And I think you can make a strong case that our running back room is as good as any duo and even not even trying to knock DJ Dallas, who's probably fighting for his life. He's not that bad. He's actually been somewhat productive for us in limited action. Mm -hmm. And then Kenny McIntosh is is a very exciting. I think he's going to be, I think he's going to make us kind of forget about Travis Homer. Uh, And that's, I think that's kind of his role a little bit of what we might see, but Walker who should have been rookie of the year should have been. And Zach Charbonnet, they perfectly complement each other. I mean, that is some real thunder and lightning. Uh, It kind of reminds me, I don't know if you remember the giants years, they were in the super bowl the first time and they had a couple of good years in between with um, was a mod Bradshaw and Brandon Jacobs. Mm -hmm. Obviously that's like a very, I remember they were called Thunder and Lightning. Yeah. We're not going to get like a Brandon Jacobs level runner from Zach Charbonnet, but like there are people that have comped Zach Charbonnet to a little bit of a, of a smaller Marshawn Lynch. Like there is some real power. And also these are two guys that can catch the ball out of the backfield. Specifically, Zach Charbonnet has been excellent in college with that, uh, playing for Chip Kelly at UCLA. That That's part of your offense. Like that is their extended run game. And I'm trying to think when's the last time Seattle had a legitimate like – dangerous running back threat out of the backfield uh you might have to go back to like 2017 um whatever the guy's name is he ended up going to washington i think but you know just that yeah mckissick like he was really fun and stuff but like it's really nice just to have that leverage or you know the the valve to release the receiving core is i believe the second best in the nfl behind Cincinnati. I think Cincinnati is head and shoulders above everyone else with Boyd, Chase, and Higgins. Those are two number one receivers on probably 20 NFL teams. Then they've got two of them, and Boyd's a very underrated number three. But in Seattle's perspective, I think this is the year we're going to see Metcalf probably really step into his prime. It makes sense. Uh, I believe this is year five. Uh, And then you're looking at you know Tyler Lockett, who's probably in the last year, maybe two more years of his prime, uh, and he's been nothing short of fantastic when he's healthy. And then Jackson Smith and Jigba, you and I have talked about him for months, uh, best wide receiver in the class without question, was probably going to be the number one receiver in the 2021 class if he was eligible to come out. Mm-hmm. And that is with teammates Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. Uh, you look at his combine, he, he, he tracks to be one of the most dangerous slot receivers to enter the league in over 10 years. And that is something that Gino excelled at. He excelled at throwing over the middle last year, which is something that Seahawks fans had not seen for since the Matt Hasselback era. And to put probably the, one of the most dangerous slot receivers, and, and we'll see. I mean, maybe Jackson Smith doesn't translate well to the NFL. I think he will, and I think immediately he's going to be a top 20 receiver, which in my opinion gives Seattle three of the top 20 receivers in the NFL. Yeah. You put those two positions there with a young and growing offensive line, that I talked about in the article, I really love the Evan Brown signing. And you know how much I love Olu Segun, Olu Atimi, mm-hmm. um, was my one of my top He's centers in the draft. Yeah, I was um, the best college football center last year. Doesn't mean he's the best prospect, but he has been, without question, the best center in college football last year and probably the year before. Uh, I, I think when you take out Austin Blythe and you take out Gabe Jackson and you can put in Olu Atimi or an Evan Brown, maybe even a Bradford from LSU who we drafted. I think the odds of them being just five to 10% better than what we saw last year from two older guys that were on their final, you know, tires, I think opens the door to so many possibilities this season, which is what led me to write that article of where I think Gino's going to be an, an MVP candidate. I think he might win it. Well, and it's interesting too. We we talk about uh, JSN as strictly a slot guy, and 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 that's all. Yeah. Pete Carroll even said it that that's where they really viewed him, and that's what they want him to focus on. That's where they think his skills uh, can help the most immediately. And I've I've said on record several times over the last month that I think there's a good chance that he actually leads the team in receiving that that he's going to get those opportunities. But in in OTAs and mandatory minicamp. We saw them using him at all three spots and using him on the outside. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's going to be a slot only guy. And that just, that really leads in nicely to your next point, which is 
and you mentioned it, you touched on it. We saw, we saw some real growth, I thought, from Shane Waldron last year in his ability to call a game. There were, there were stops and starts. There, there were some good and bad. Um, but he has never had, and, and I think you can make the argument, and, and I, maybe we already have, that I can't remember an offensive coordinator in Seattle, at least not one of Pete Carroll's offensive coordinators, that had this many assets to work with. And the draft just added more to that. And so you give Shane Waldron another year, Geno Smith with all the snaps he had last year and you give him a chance to work. How do you feel about the third year offensive coordinator going into this season? I think this is Shane Waldron's last year as the Seattle Seahawks offensive coordinator. And I think that's because he will be a head coach by next season. Uh, I feel, I feel very strongly about that. You know, when I have, I have an article coming out and we're going to talk about um, kind of piggybacking off this Geno Smith MVP stuff, just kind of explaining how high this offense can fly this year. And I was looking at comps for this team and, and the roster that's being built with some really exciting young, run, young running backs, a good offensive line that's up and coming. And then three receivers that you can't like all three are number one level receivers. Cause that's, I, I do think that's what Jackson will end up looking like towards the end of the season. Mm-hmm. And then an accurate quarterback that is maybe a little bit above a game manager. And then the team that I kept going back to was the 2018 Rams. And, and for people that might forget the 2018 Rams went 13 and three in a somewhat down NFC. There was one other elite team in the NFC and that was the new Orleans saints that year. Uh, and the Rams went 13 and three. They were second in the NFL in scoring at 32.9 points per game. The only reason why they weren't first was because of that was the first year of the, of the Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey explosion when they were scoring, I believe 36 a game, which is crazy to think about. Um, and that team went all the way to the Super Bowl. They went into New Orleans uh, and they, they beat the Saints. We all know what happened in that game. Uh, but the Saints, the, the Rams were unstoppable that year. And Jared Goff had the best year of his career. And they probably win the Super Bowl if Cooper Cup doesn't tear his ACL against the Seahawks in, yeah. in week 10. And so when, when they were, they were scoring 35 points a game with Cooper cup, he went down. They had one massive explosive game against the chiefs on Monday night football, that 54 to 50 game, I think is what it was. And then after that, the the numbers went down for golf. The numbers went down for, for all the receivers, but you're talking about a team that had Robert Woods in this prime Brandon cooks in his prime and Cooper cup. They were all on pace for all over 75 to 80 catches. They were all on pace for over a thousand yards and they were all on pace for anywhere from six to 10 touchdowns with a healthy Todd Gurley as he was about to fall apart. Like right. the wheels came off at, in Atlanta in that super bowl and they only scored three points, but that was probably the future of the offense because you took the most talent that someone's had in this McVay Shanahan style that we've seen in years and even with the Jared Goff at quarterback, that team was unbelievable. Unbelievable on offense. Do you know who the passing game coordinator of that team was? Uh, Shane Waldron. Shane Waldron. <laughs> Shane Waldron is a disciple of Sean McVay. We might hate the man. We might hate the hairline. That dude is a genius. That dude That dude makes us look ugly. <laughs> that dude makes us look ugly, but he, he is a very good coach. I understand things are kind of getting a little bit weird there with roster but when you don't have talent it's hard to win but when he had talent he kicked our butt i believe they beat us what was that 49 to 7 or 42 to 7 in seattle that year yeah i remember that game well i watched it in leavenworth at a bar yeah i was coming back on a road trip and i thought we gotta watch the game and we found a place really and within 10 minutes we wanted to leave well at least you had some good food and some good drinks there (laughs) was indeed but but you know when you talk about shane waldron i I love the hire because it is an interesting hire. We'll never probably know if it was a hire for post Russell Wilson or if it was a hire to save Russell Wilson, mm. but you know, he doesn't look or talk the part of an NFL head coach. I know you talked to Bob Condota about it mm. and I I'm, I'm right there with you. Like he doesn't look the part, neither did like Daryl Bevel back in the day, right. but this guy, this guy can kind of cook a little bit. Um, did you know that, that Shane Waldron had the Seahawks rank seventh in the NFL in points scored to start the first half? or start the second half. So kind of getting I, off to a head start. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that number, but I do, you know, I, I think that's one of the things I have liked about him is it was a struggle for the longest time under Bevel and then under Schottenheimer to, to just get started and get, and get things going early in games. And whether that was a Russell Wilson issue or a play calling issue, it seems like uh, Shane, Shane has a good plan and, and yeah. things together at the beginning of beginning of halves. 
Yeah, so that's I think that what that shows me is that means he's taken some of the McVeigh and Shanahan disciple, which I think that's what everyone talks about. Can you survive the first quarter and the third quarter against Kyle Shanahan? Because when he scripts his plays, he's very, very talented. It's what happens afterwards. That's when you get them. And that's something we will need to watch Shane Waldron and how he adapts. But in 2021, he took over with the awkward post let Russ cook debacle. And when Russ was healthy for those first four games, they averaged 25.7 points a game. That would have been good for top 10 in the NFL. Obviously, Russ got hurt and things kind of went weird. Last year, he gets Geno Smith, a team that nobody thinks is going to be very good. And I think they finished the year ninth in scoring, right? And, and what, what really got me interested in talking more about Geno in this offense was looking at that nine-game stretch from, from Detroit's the win at Detroit to the win at L.A. Um, before the offensive line fell apart. And there were some games in there where the offensive line definitely fell apart, but there was also the defense fell apart even worse and stuff. Yeah. And so, But during that time, that nine-game stretch, they scored 31.1 points per game. That is two points better than what the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs averaged for the season. Hmm. So for a night, I mean, that's not that's not a very, I mean, that's it's a somewhat small sample size, but it's over half a season right. where the Seahawks were the best offensive football by over two points over the Kansas City Chiefs. Like, there's something there. We're talking about it if they can stay healthy and fix the interior offensive line and get a third wide receiver. And they did. Right. They did. Like, like that's that's where I'm at. It's yeah. You're allowing Shane Waldron this opportunity to cook. That 31.1 points is the best somebody has scored, averaged, since the 2020 Green Bay Packers, which was the Aaron Rodgers MVP year. And that was when there was no fans on the field and Aaron Rodgers could hear everything he needed to hear and cook and, and absolutely you know, destroy slaughter defenses. That's, that's where I'm looking at, where, where Shane, you're, you're giving him tools when he's been successful full i would say successful without tools he's been a little bit over 500 with 75 percent or even 60 percent of what he needs to succeed because i believe if you don't have a healthy interior offensive line and you don't have a healthy quarterback you're not going to win and it looks like he has both those things now and i think i think he's going to put up some massive points this season for this offense well, and I've been saying for a while that that early in the season they're going to need to do that. This this defense, uh, regardless of how it ultimately comes together, it's it's so heavily reliant on uh, young players and players that are new to the roster, especially in the front seven. Um, that early in the season, this offense a good thing. There's some some uh, some continuity because they're going to need to carry the defense early in the season. And then the schedule came out, and I thought, okay. I like how the schedule sets up so that early in the season, it's more favorable. Let that defense get their feet under him. The offense can score some points and carry him. But you make the point, and this is your your uh, third and final point in, in your recent piece, that the schedule, in a similar way, also works in favor of Geno potentially establishing uh, an MVP campaign. Yeah, uh, being MVP it includes numbers, so, you know, stats, winning, and storyline. Right. And, and there was few storylines better in the NFL last year than Geno Smith, mm -hmm. whether he wanted to acknowledge it was a great storyline or, or not right back. Um, it was it was arguably one of the best stories in all of football last year. This is a guy that has been holding on for dear life. And all of a sudden he went out and threw 30 touchdowns, completed 70 percent of his passage, broke the franchise record for passing yards and. He won comeback play of the year, and thanks to the Detroit Lions, he got the Seattle Seahawks into the playoffs. And with about 17 minutes to go, it looked like they had a real shot to steal that game. And so you go into this season, great numbers you already put up, and the weaknesses of the Seattle Seahawks got addressed, in my opinion. I think they, they, they got addressed on the offensive side. I, we've talked enough about defensive tackles. Uh, you and I, we don't need to keep talking about it. But on the offensive side, I believe between Evan Brown and Olu Segun, Gino will have time to step up in the pocket. And when he had time to step up in the pocket last year during those nine games, that would have averaged out to 37 touchdowns, only seven interceptions. Uh, what I have here, 4,600 yards, 112 passer rating. That's MVP numbers that are going to go toe to toe, in my opinion, with a Mahomes who will have that voter fatigue, a Jalen Hurts who has a lot more pressure this year with the contract and a Joe Burrow that, is fantastic in the playoffs, but so far hasn't really exploded yet offensively numbers wise in the regular season. Yeah. So you have the numbers and now you have the schedule, which gives the Seahawks an opportunity 
in my opinion, to have a good start. You know, a, a great opportunity week one at home to get a head start on your division rival. And, and it's tough. Aaron Donald is as fresh as he's going to be this season. So that kind of does suck. But I do think without Jalen Ramsey, I think we might see DK Metcalf just punk the Rams if if our interior offensive line can hold Aaron Donald out. Then you talk about some of these big matchups where the Seahawks go to the Giants on Monday night football. Yeah. In in the early fall, you've talked about this. You told me that there's not a more perfect time to catch an East Coast team at night than a nice, I think it's an October game. You know, it might be a little bit wet, but it should be a great night. And what better story than on national television for Geno Smith to go back to where this all began, right? At yeah. MetLife Stadium where his career died before it took off you know, a house of horrors for him to light it up. I, I think that's the storyline week four that shoots him, shoots him up as long as Seattle's winning. Then you got battles against Joe Burrow and Cincinnati. You're going to have to put up 31 points to, to win that game. Maybe even 34 at home against Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Like that might be an MVP battle. That might be an, just saying that, that could be who gets a top seed in the NFC. Thanksgiving night at home against your arch rival, San Francisco 49ers. Mm-hmm. You know, that is something that I grew up knowing that was the rivalry, you know, of right. people fears younger me now, people above us, they know like the 49ers rival Seahawks rivalry has kind of faded a little bit late lately, but the playoff matchup that from last year, it's starting to per, per, you know percolate and come back up again. And who knows who the quarterback is for the 49ers then, but that could be a great opportunity for Seattle to right. maybe, not clinch the division it's a little bit early, but to kind of separate or get the leg up. And there's a few other games in there that are going to be massive, but I don't know if there's a better quartet of opportunities. Smith. And, and to get a win and, and also win the storylines, you know, you beat the giants in New York you, you compete with Joe Burrow. I don't expect Seattle to win that game. And then you win a big time, might even be flexed at that point against the Eagles. And yeah. then you're looking at Thanksgiving against the 49ers. I think those are your core four. And then you look at the rest of the schedule. He's going to he's gonna score against the Cardinals. He's going to score against the Rams. I really do. I guess. Playing against the Panthers. You're playing against the, the, the Commanders. These are teams that are trying to lose. Like I, I think there's a real chance where he could he could go for 40 touchdowns. It's interesting. I hadn't thought about that when I looked at the schedule. I was thinking just in terms of the team and and getting off to sort of having favorable matchups early. But you're right. Part of winning an MVP in the in the eyes of the national media and the voters and the East Coast voters in particular is you got to get off to a good start. Like the let Russ cook year. You know, he got off that mm-hmm. eight game unbelievable historic start. And then he couldn't maintain it. But you get people talking about you first and you get on all the debate shows and ESPN first take and all that talking about is Gino for real. But then the second half of the season, especially that like second or that third quarter of the season, when you do Mm -hmm. have, you mentioned the Eagles, the 49ers twice in three weeks, that that's the point of the season where if you have any doubters and then you go play well on those stages against those teams, then you can really solidify. Uh, yeah. Know. Yeah. Those are the moments where, you know, uh, you know, talking, I know we were talking about early in the season earlier, like that's where Joe Buck or Troy Aikman are, are talking on ESPN of like, man, what a story. Unbelievably comes in this place. You know, that's going to get pumped up. They're yeah. going to interview him before the game. They're going to interview him after the game. Hey, you just scored three touchdowns and threw for 300 yards in this place. And he's like, this place is like any other place, right? I'm a Seahawk. Like I can already see it and stuff. And, and everyone's, you know, Lewis Riddick has been huge on it. Um, we, you know, the Athlon sports article came out, which is, which is wild, you know, I mean, that's awesome. Um, but you can see the momentum starting to build Uh, Bill Simmons, Ryan Rosillo on the ringer. They talked about, they love the Seahawks as a sneaky threat to push the 49ers around. I personally think the Seahawks are going to win the NFC West, but everyone else thinks they're a wild card team. So you have this baseline of like, Ooh, they could maybe get back to where they were last year. Well, if they, you know, overgo expectations and win the NFC West, huge, huge storylines. And and, and you're talking about in order to do that, you're going to have to put up numbers and you're going to have to protect Gino. And yeah, the Seahawks are going to have to run the football really well to to keep some of these teams off balance. But with the weapons they have, I, I think, 
you're looking at a team that could win 12 to 13 games. And if, and if Gino splits, you know, um, let's say he dominates the Giants and then he splits the Burrow, Jalen Hurts, and he splits against the 49ers, goes two and two. Like, it's not far-fetched to see this team losing two more games the rest of the way, looking at that schedule. I mean, I'm trying to be optimistic, you know, also being conservative, like 12 or 13 wins and good stats will put him right up there. And if the Eagles slip at all and the, and the Bengals aren't the number one seed, I think you'll see some real voter fatigue with Mahomes winning again. And I think Gino could easily go in there and steal that. I think there's at listening to you talk, uh, something else came to mind. I think there's uh, another sort of intangible factor as well that can play in uh, in a player's favor when it comes to MVP, and that's likability. And I think, I think if that momentum starts and 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 Gino starts getting the national interviews and the big pregame spots and and that kind of thing, he's a likable guy in interviews. He's, mm-hmm. he's his positivity and his confidence is very infectious. His story, as you mentioned, is great. Uh, the fact that he took that he was willing to bet on himself and take a team friendly contract at, you know, mm-hmm. kind of that, that rare unicorn of a mid-level quarterback contract that we didn't think existed, that he was willing mm-hmm. to do that. Um, I think all those things can work in their favor too. And it, and if it all goes that way and you touched on it, you've got a piece coming out uh, in the next day or two, let's talk ceiling. What's best case scenario. How good can the Seahawks offense be? And if everything clicks, are we talking about one of the elite offenses in the league this year? Yeah, I do. I do. I think Gino has signed a contract that rewards him for what happened last year and opens the door to him having a very lucrative next two years, but there's still an out on that contract. So you rewarded him by also telling, but you also have that, you know, Hey, if, if you don't hold up, there's a heck of a draft class coming up with a bunch of quarterbacks. We might go a different direction. And that might even be if he plays, Oh, what? Okay. You know, if he plays okay, you know, he needs to play great for Seattle to be great. But you're talking about, again, earlier, a great running back tandem that you'd probably put up there against anybody in the league. A young and ascending offensive line. Nobody wants an old and descending offensive line. you got a young ascending offensive line that is littered with award winners and and some badass big dudes that are going to push some people around. They might make some mistakes early on in the year because of their youth, but by the end of the year, if they're healthy, look out. Look out. Like, nobody talks about Charles Cross. Like we, we drafted a franchise left tackle and he was very, very solid last year. He's probably going to be better this year. Like that's, that's how that, that development usually works. And then the receiving core, big numbers. Uh, I, I fully expect for Seattle to push for three 1,000 yard receivers. We might come up just a little short with the Pete Carroll philosophy of some of the ground and pound, but I think there's a real shot where all three of those guys are really close. And I think that Tyler Lockett would actually be the one to probably not get a thousand out of those ones. I'm right there with you on JSN. I just think he is going to just cause so many problems for the middle of the defense that we're going to see some bombs to Lockett and, and Metcalf from Gino that we haven't seen as open in a while because people are so focused on what JSN is doing. And then we haven't even talked about, you got three tight ends that are technically all either in a contract year or in a cut year. Yeah. You know what they all had? They all had good moments in the last year. Mm-hmm. They all had little moments. And in, in my guess is of those three, one of those guys is going to want to earn a contract, right? Like one of those guys is going to step up. I really like, I think that's Paul Parkinson. I think he's really got a, sh- a good shot to dominate in the red zone. And I just think you take all these pieces You give Shane Waldron more than you've ever given him before. You have the storyline. You have a schedule that I think gives you a chance to have a really nice first half of the year where you can go six and two, seven and three, something of that nature. I think this is a team that's going to win the NFC West. I I really do. I think, I think the NFC is as weak as we have seen it arguably since the 2005, 2006 Seahawks years when they were the one seed at 13 and three and like the two seed was like 11 and five, like yeah. just a, a kind of a weaker, weaker class. Uh, and, and I think in this NFC, I think you win this division. I think you're probably going to be the two seed. I think the NFC South is a mess. I think the NFC North is going to be a bloodbath of mediocre teams. And I think if the Seattle Seahawks can overcome San Francisco, they're going to be the two seed. And I really do think that they are going to end up in Philadelphia for the NFC championship. I, I, re- I really do. I think I think Gino is playing for for his future still, and I think this team is ascending. And it might be a year early, honestly, but because of your schedule and because of the opponents you have in such a terrible NFC this year, sometimes you're ahead of schedule. And I think this is a year we're going to look back and be like, hey, you know, Seahawks are kind of ahead of schedule. 
but it was pretty cool that we got to the NFC Championship or maybe screwed around and got to a Super Bowl. Interesting stuff. Michael Thompson, as always, writes for 12th Man Rising. You can follow him on Twitter at Michael T underscore zero five. Thanks for joining me again, my friend. We'll have you on again soon. Uh, we originally had touched base about, we were going to talk this week about 2024 draft eligible quarterbacks. A little too soon for that. I thought it was better to address uh, to address the offense and uh, appreciate your insight as always. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel or the audio version wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss out on stuff like this. Still trying to sync up schedules with Paul Moyer. He'll be on the show uh, sometime in the next week. Keep your eye out for that. And you know how you know when those episodes come out, you subscribe to the show. So please do that. Really appreciate all the support lately. Thanks for joining me. Thank you again, Michael. Until next time, forever and always, go Hawks. Go Hawks.